Video games, a necessity for gracious living. On this channel in the past, we have looked at the history of all sorts of weird and wonderful hardware. The epic console wars between Nintendo and Sega, for example, would result in all sorts of strange and bizarre efforts. But something that fewer people will be aware of is that there is indeed a piece of hardware out there that both Nintendo and Sega teamed up on and worked on together. The platform I am referring to is known as the Triforce, a system named directly after the coveted ultimate source of power that can be found within the Legend of Zelda series. This sacred relic is made up of three golden triangles that represent power, wisdom and courage. Like the Triforce of Zelda mythology, the Triforce system's three triangles also represent three different things. In this case, they represent Sega, Nintendo and Namco, as this trio of companies would go on a joint venture to create one unified machine. While this may sound like the stuff of legends, this literally actually happened. So let's go back and explore this tale to find out why and what this system was capable of. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Nintendo Sega Namco Triforce system. To fully understand this story, we need to go back to the dawn of the millennium, a period in which the console wars were beginning to shift drastically. After losing abysmally to the might of the Sony PlayStation 2, Sega made the decision to discontinue their Sega Dreamcast, which made a lot of sense, particularly when we take into account that Microsoft with their Xbox platform were entering the home market too. This would mean in the home console market that Sega would begin to function as a third-party publisher, releasing games for other companies' hardware. I mean, let's be honest, it certainly felt like hell had frozen over when Edgy the Hedgy began showing up on the Nintendo GameCube and Game Boy Advance, but it was certainly symbolic that the war between Nintendo and Sega was finally over. This would present some interesting possibilities and what-if scenarios regarding the two companies, with many pondering if Nintendo and Sega's relationship would only strengthen from here on out. So what would Sega decide to do in their new post-apocalyptic reality? Well, obviously, as highlighted in today's intro, they would function as one of the three companies that would develop the Triforce system, an arcade board that was created in a unified effort to aid not just Sega, but Nintendo and Namco too. This was beneficial to all the parties involved, as the Triforce would bring a lot of positives to the table, for starters. While Sega's older Naomi board was based on the Sega Dreamcast, making the conversion of games easy, the Triforce on the other hand was based on the GameCube, allowing for games to be ported between the home and arcade system much more easily. Not only was this a more simplistic and cost-effective method for all involved, but there were other benefits to the parties too. One example of this was that Nintendo had stopped developing and publishing their own arcade games a long time ago, but now both Sega and Namco could use their famous licenses to produce arcade games that featured Nintendo's legendary IPs. Sega would be the first company to begin developing games for this new hardware, with the first Triforce game to see release being Virtua Striker 2002. This game, which was of course also being released on the Nintendo GameCube, would continue Sega's legendary Virtua Striker series and, like other games published by Sega that would see release for the Triforce, would be made available through Sega's proprietary GD-ROM format. Moving on to the following year, 2003, more Sega distributed Triforce games would be surfacing, including the first to use a Nintendo IP. The game I'm referring to is F-Zero AX, which would be developed by Sega's Amusement Vision department. 
This successor to F0X brings back the high-speed racing the franchise is famed for and was released alongside its more famous GameCube counterpart known as F0GX. The main difference between the two relate to the number of vehicles and tracks, with each version having its fair share of exclusiveness. Being a coin-munching arcade game though, the main difference is AX's extreme level of difficulty. I guess Nintendo Sega arcade games were now a thing. That year would also see the release of Gekito Pro Yakyu, a title that seems to be a baseball game, which as a Brit with Sri Lankan heritage, I refuse to make a comment on. But uh, if this featured a real sport, like cricket, it would be an entirely different story. In that I would still refuse to comment because I think that cricket is boring and that opinion is an affront to all of my heritages. The Triforce that year would also function as the home of the first Avalon no Kagi game, a card based title that is also known as the Key of Avalon and mixes board game and card gameplay. This game featured card reader technology whereby gamers could have their deck read in seconds. Cabinets would also feature touch screens rather than buttons, which was slowly becoming more common 19 years ago. We are so old. Past this point, on the Sega side of things, we would only receive updates, reiterations and sequels to existing Sega games on the hardware. This would include 2004's F-Zero AX Monster Ride, which uses a Simuline Psycraft cabinet, a pod which is suspended above the ground and has three degrees of freedom in movement. There would also be two more versions of the Key of Avalon to see release and two more versions of Virtuous Striker 4. But we still have the Namco side of things to talk about, which personally, I think is much more interesting. Namco would not begin releasing games for the Triforce until 2005 and would ship its software on bespoke ROM cartridges. All of the Namco Triforce games would utilise Nintendo IPs, but sadly some of these games were left exclusively in Japan and one was cancelled altogether, which we shall get to soon. As for the games left in the Japanese arcades, these would include Donkey Kong Jungle Fever and Donkey Kong Banana Kingdom, which were sequels to Jungle Beat, released for the GameCube previously. The most significant games released for the Triforce hardware, in my opinion, would be the first two Mario Kart GP games, the first ever Mario Kart games to make it to the arcades. The first GP game also made history by being the first Mario Kart to include crossover characters such as Namco's Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man and Blinky the Ghost, which would all be playable. In fact, in the second game players could also play as a Tamagotchi named Mamichi, which is also a nice little addition. As for the first game, 24 tracks would be offered up in total, with both new and old items becoming available to utilise in races, with a lock-on feature for items being introduced. Further to this, a temporary shield when using power sliding was also included, which added to the novelty for the first game. The game's sequel, GP2, would introduce further tracks that continue to build on the chaos of the first game. Mario Kart the GP cabinets, from my life experience at least, have been prolific, with these cabinets being present in every family arcade I've been to, bowling alley, retail park and seaside town known to man. These little shits are absolutely everywhere and I am all for it. While Mario Kart GP is no doubt the Triforce system's greatest legacy, perhaps the most mysterious chapter in this hardware's history relates to the platform's Star Fox game, which never seems to have surfaced. Back in the day when Star Fox Assault was announced, an accompanying arcade game was also promoted. Reportedly, nothing project has been heard about since, resulting in a game that I and many other people would likely want to learn more about. But as I always say on this channel, the internet is a funny place and just because there is not information on this now, doesn't mean something won't get linked in the future. Someone out there must know something. 
So I guess that brings our Triforce tale to a close, covering every video game that ever saw release for a piece of hardware that most people are not even familiar with. Most won't know specifically about the Triforce hardware, but there are very few gamers out there who haven't played the Mario Kart GP games or its many follow-ups at least once. So the Triforce's legacy lives on even if only specifically due to those games. F-Zero, Donkey Kong, Mario Kart, what's not to love about the time Sega, Nintendo and Namco teamed up to make one crazy chimera. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the Nintendo Sega Namco Triforce system. Well if you enjoyed today's video then please like, subscribe, comment and hit that notification bell. And usually at the end of my videos I like to answer questions from my patrons, however I appear to have run out of questions to answer. So. My, my darling Patreon backers, please head over to Patreon now and submit a question for me to answer in my next video. And without further ado, special, special thanks go out to my lovely patrons, starting with... Joseph Fleming, Boyd Chan, MJS256, Joe Bory, William J. Scott III, Christopher Puckett, Arthur Hackett, Revenant, House of the Ted, Sebastian Velez, Kevin Lips, Gabe Canada, the LEEC Legum Effort Electronics Channel, Zelinkdorf, Third Dwarf, Taxationist Theft, Tony Tran, Travis Ortis, Joseph K, Revan Kane, Christopher Geese, Okio Kionji, 2010, Spartan Fist, 117, Nao, Matt Fall, Lawrence Manning, Pi, Damien Wells, Frank, 1982, Big Papa Pickles, Drone, Moose and Rabbit, Tony Maltezos, Johnny Holly, Tebow back in Sir Landry does gaming, Christopher Diviello, Richard Turnbull, Ben Harradine, Green Cooper, John Laurie, Matthew Langtree, Brandon Kays, Eric Rounds, Daniel, Man Shovel, Alex Hughes, Glendon Bill, NS Thriller, Travis Flanker, Julian Carl, Dubois Lafay, Blood Blue 85, Swag Boy, UK Kraut Gaming, Proswell, Anthony Ryan Bennett, Brent O'Hara, Tim Meffy Hansmer, Ryan Dacker, Dizzy Koala, Sandbox Larry, Wesley Tomatsu, Triforce of Shadows, Robert Honnebrook, OPC, Emu Movies.com, Gasper Heller, Sagemeister, and Ago, as well as all of the rest of my lovely patrons. Thank you all so much for sticking around until this point of the video, and I shall see you all next time.